Okay, um, good morning. So what I'm going to be talking about now is a subject that was quite old, but very important. That's why I thought we should talk about it in this workshop as a lot of people use radar data. Uh, you need to know the quality of the radar that you use and the quality of the data that goes into a lot of your inversion processes. So uh, I decided to talk about this overview of radar calibration, especially specifically uh, polarimetric radar calibration, and that's, uh, we are going to talk about why we need such a thing, you know, different calibration techniques that we have developed over the years, and then uh, we'll show you some of the results where it was used during the CERSI mission uh, in 1994. So uh, basically, when you have a radar system, you are getting collecting backscatter from the scene, right? And the parameters of the scene are so many. You know, if you have vegetation, like what Leon was showing, you have tree trunk, you have vegetation biomass, you have structure of the um, vegetation, you have a rough surface underneath, you have probably a short vegetation underneath, you have soil moisture. There are so many parameters that would influence the backscatter that the radar is measuring for you, right? So for that reason, you would need to have a lot of measurements. So for example, you can use angular variation of the radar backscatter as one parameters that you can use. You can choose different frequencies, so you can use L-band and C-band or maybe P-band for your measurements, and you can um, also use the polarization response of the backscatter. So if you transmit V, you would receive V. If you transmit horizontal polarization, you would receive horizontal and vertical. So you can form this matrix of polarization. So this polarization is an independent set of, for example, information uh, in addition to, let's say, change in frequency or angle of incidence. So Specifically, we are going to talk about this radar polarimetry because it has a lot of interesting, you know, uh, features of the target that are captured. For example, orientation of the branches. That is embedded in the polarization response. And how much uh, attenuation goes through depending on whether you are copole or crosspole, that would be different. So that's a very nice distinguishing parameter that, that we are going to use. And in a lot of inverse model, so you know, eventually you collect this data because you want to get into the biophysical parameters. You know, you usually have a forward scattering model similar to what Leon was showing. You put that into an inversion, you compare that with your data. Therefore, your data has to be precisely calibrated. Calibrated with respect to some known value. Otherwise, you would not have a very good um, uh, inversion process. However, for a lot of applications, this backscattering cross-section, that's the radar cross-section area per unit area, that's how we basically quantify as a measurable of the radar imaging radar. They have a very limited dynamic range. I can give you an example. If you're looking at soil moisture at L-band frequency, you have about 10, 10 dB variation in sigma naught if you go from dry soil to saturated soil. That is not very much. And if you go to higher frequency, let's say C-band, that dynamic range even gets shorter. So you don't have much room to play. Therefore, it's very important when you do radiometric calibration of your radar, that uncertainty in the backscatter measurement needs to be within a half a dB maximum. Another information in polarimetry is also the phase information. You have a phase information between vertical and horizontal. So between vertical and horizontal polarization, if you have a tree trunk, the phase difference is 180 degrees. So if you see the phase difference is high, you know that there is a dominant component of ground trunk interaction. That goes into your inversion algorithm. So measurement accuracy of the phase within five degree is, is also required for, more, um, for most applications. When you're talking about calibrating some, something or you're doing measurement, you always make errors in your measurement. Measurement errors can be divided into two groups. One is a systematic error. That is something that you can fix. 
if you identify, if you characterize your system well, you say, okay, when I transmit B, I'm also uh, transmitting a little bit of H, 10% H. I can figure that out and I can correct for that. And there are some non-deterministic errors that are not repeatable, like thermal noise, or if you make an error, for example, pointing your antenna this way instead of this way, these are the things that would remain in the data and you cannot later on fix those things. So let's go back and concentrate on the um, systematic error. If you do, uh, let me just tell you, you know, what that uh, polarization response can come into your measurement. If you have a target, again, if you transmit V, you receive V, that gives you one parameter, we call it SVV. If you transmit V, receive H, then you have another parameter, we call it SHV, and so on and so forth. So there are four complex numbers that you can measure out of this polarimetric radar, and these contain information about your targets, right? So the target can have some chirality you can measure, it can have a specific vertical or horizontal polarization response. That polarization response can become a discriminating factor in terms of semantically identifying what the target is. If you're operating in backscatter, instead of getting four complex number measurement, um, reciprocity, which is one of the fundamental properties of electromagnetic wave, imposes that SHV and SVH are the same. So that takes away uh, one complex number out of your measurement. And the other factor is that we cannot measure the range within a fraction of a wavelength. Therefore, the absolute phase of SVV doesn't have any information. If you pull that phase of SVV out, then the number of actual measurement in backscatter that you can get out of any target is magnitude of SVV, magnitude of cross pole, magnitude of HH, and phase difference between VVHH and HVVH. When we're talking about a random volume or random surface or random media, the absolute value of these things don't mean anything because we have fading. Fading is caused by having multiple scattering centers within your illuminated area. That fluctuation makes the braid or backscatter, instead of being a something deterministic, it makes it into a statistical thing. So we are interested in the statistics of the radar backscatter when we are dealing with um, polarimetric radar, imaging radar for, for example, terrestrial things. So if you have a radar system, you cannot, of course, go and measure the scattering matrix. As I mentioned, there are uh, systematic error in your measurement. So an actual radar, you have a transmitter, you have a transfer function, you have an amplifier, you have some delay in there, it goes to a TR switch, then it goes to a dual polarized antenna. That can cause also a problem. And then you transmit what uh, you think you were transmitting V, but some of that energy also leaks to H channel, and you're transmitting some H. And then when the signal goes back again, some of it goes to the receiver, some of it goes to the V receiver, H channel receiver, V channel receiver, that have different, again, transfer function. All of these variation, the distortion matrix of your antenna, the channel imbalances, or the model for this uh, systematic error. And the measure the scattering matrix, therefore, can be expressed in terms of that original scattering matrix that is multiplied by two distortion matrices. We call this transmit distortion matrix. We call this one receive distortion matrix. This, the objective of a calibration process is to determine what this T is and what this R is. And if you do that, then you can go back to uh, basically the scattering matrix. So you would like to remove antenna crosstalk, channel imbalances, and also determine the radiometric calibration constant. Okay, so um, there are different techniques that people had developed in the past. You know, some of these techniques for point targets, you needed the three uh, thin cylinders, vertical, horizontal, 45. But then the problem with this type of calibration is that if you have ever done any measurement of the radar, if you put a cylinder in the view of a radar, if you tilt it slightly, the RCS can change drastically. So it becomes very sensitive to alignment. These techniques would never work precisely. 
Then there were uh, generalized calibration techniques that they attempted to get rid of those cylinders, but nevertheless, you are still very much constrained to uh, orientation of this target. Then we developed another technique that would only require one target that was insensitive to the target alignment in your calibration procedure. And that is what I'm going to talk a little bit about this to see how these distortion matrices are, can be obtained using the physics of the scattering problem and what goes in, in, in reality, instead of having four complex unknown in transmit distortion matrix, four complex unknown in receiver distortion matrix, we are going to see how we can shrink that, going into the physics of the problem, and just use a single calibration target that is insensitive to alignment, like a sphere, in order to get the full distortion matrix, right? So, um, so basically, in this technique, you know, we are taking uh, take a look at this dual polarized antenna, for example, and represent this dual polarized antenna in terms of four ports that are connected. Let's say this is your orthomode transducer, this is vertical port, this is horizontal port, and you're expecting to transmit V and H output. So I'm extending this notion of a scattering matrix for a multi-port microwave passive device into two port, actual port that are connected to transmission lines and two direction in a space. So these ports are in free space. We can generalize that definition and then you can have this scattering matrix notation for that when you transmit V, you expect everything to go in V but some of it can go to H and so on and so forth, right? The representation of that generalized scattering matrix is a four by four matrix but if I extend this port to where the target sits, you know, this is the range to my target, the scattering matrix can be uh, transformed into a shape like that because you're moving two ports away and then you have these delays that come. If you have a radar, of course you can range gate. So these are short reflection that comes from here. This is double bonds between the target and the antenna. And this is simply the signal that comes, goes from the antenna, hits the target, and comes back because it has only a single delay. If you do range gating, then the matrix becomes isolated. The two channels can become isolated, and you can express what illuminates, for example, the target to what is reflected in terms of this portion of the matrix, what is reflected from the target to what is coming back in terms of this matrix. And we know that the relationship between the third ports are related to the scattering matrix of the target itself. So this is the target itself. Some of these terms are due to the reflection of that OMT and the antenna structure itself. So if you pull these components on now, you're also adding the channel imbalances of the receiver and transmitter, you would get a matrix uh, like that. Those C represents the crosstalk <coughs> scattering matrix of the target, and T are the channel imbalances for transmitter V and, and H direction. Now, as you can see, instead of having eight unknowns, now because of this physics space representation, in fact, there are only six complex unknowns. Most dual polarized antennas, whether you have a square aperture or circular aperture, by design, they are made symmetric. If you have a square patch, for example, the V and H channel are made symmetrically. So those crosstalk, what goes from V to H, is the same as what goes from H to V. Therefore, C1 and C2 are also equal. This reduces the number of unknowns to five. But R and T, I don't need to individually um, calibrate them. If I factor R1 and T1, in fact, they would come as a product, and the total number of unknown now is just four. Therefore, if I measure a single target that has four backscatter measurement, that is sufficient to get everything. Okay, so once you find the distortion matrix, you can find the scattering matrix like that. I'll show you some examples that we did. We measured an eight inch sphere, for example, as a calibration target. We had a polarimetric X-band radar, and then we measured a six inch sphere and a, a vertical, let's say, uh, uh, cylinder and you'll show that you can get very accurate results. So 
Um, for example, if you uh, look at that uh, six inch sphere, the theoretical value of the radar backscatter <coughs> over the range of frequency we did the measurement is like that. These are the actual measurement for VB and HH. And of course, the error is less than half a dB. The phase difference between V and H is less than two degrees. Shows you that we can very precisely do this measurement. Now, sphere does not create crossfall. So let's say if this is the VV response, if I ignore the crosstalk in the antenna, I would measure actually a crossfall response of the sphere, which I know it's wrong. Um, but if you go through this distortion correction matrix, you will see that the measured crossbow response from the sphere is actually at the noise floor of my measurement system. And you can get you know, more than 45 dB isolation as you expect. So it, it correct for uh, that as well. So this is another target that you can measure. You know, this was a vertical cylinder. You get a very nice response from that. And these are uh, basically the crossbow from a vertical cylinder. Again, there should not be any crossbow. And, and we show that we can uh, remove the crosstalk. And this is the phase difference within few degrees of the theoretical value that we can measure. So in reality, what type of targets are used for imaging radar? So that is if you want to calibrate a, a, a polarimetric radar only at the bore side. Uh, the antenna pattern itself if you look at the response of a target, for example, if you are slightly off the bore side, the distortion matrix by itself can also change. So that these pose certain challenges when you are doing imaging radar calibration. In reality, people use these top hat type uh, corner reflectors. Um, the advantage of this top hat corner reflector is that you are independent of angle of orientation. So if your SAR, for example, flies that way, you don't have to rotate your corner reflector that way. The top hat would allow you to uh, mount that without worrying about the orientation or, of the, or the flight path. However, the radar cross-section of this is not very high. Dihedral corner reflector is, again, you know, a target that has very large radar cross-section, but then you're very sensitive to orientation with respect to this edge. Because the beam width in, in that direction is extremely narrow. All right? So if you move it slightly, you're off by 10 dB very quickly. So oftentimes, trihedral corner reflectors are used because they are independent of, almost independent of angle of incidence, the RCS, and they can provide a very large RCS value. And then, of course, more recently, this is a, a radar calibrator that was uh, developed for uh, the late SMAP radar. Um, and, but now we are using it for um, a NISAR uh, system and uh, UAV SAR that was developed here. Before this system, um, one of the problems of active radar calibrator was uh, instability in not knowing exactly the gain of uh, the amplifier that is in the uh, loop of these type of um, targets. But we fixed this so you can now get uh, accuracy in the gain of the whole system within 0.1 dB over a very large period of time. Another issue that is dealt with point target is that some of when you, we always place these radars on the ground. So interaction of the ground and point targets, these are not in free space, creates uncertainty on, in the RCS of this type of um, targets. And one of the things we did uh, at the time was to realize that if you have a corner reflector and you're illuminating this at bore side, the lit area, you know, so corner reflector is basically you're coming here, uh, the reflected signal goes to this panel, goes to this panel, and then come back towards the radar. This is a retroreflective type um, target. You know, uh, these pentagonal shape areas, these lit areas that I'm showing with yellow color, are only a portion of the surface that would contribute to the backscatter. We call this self-illuminating. So if you are coming from this, every point on that yellow is mapped to another point on the second panel and on the third panel. Actually, there are a whole class of these type of targets that if you're interested, there is a paper on that that you can design that has this property, okay? So we said that uh, since that is the case, uh, and 
if a reflection from the ground can hit the top that, um, shaded area, that contributes. But if we confine the uh, corner reflector only to that pentagonal shape, nothing from outside can be captured in the cavity of the corner reflector. So we designed a, a set of corner reflectors, like these pentagonal corner reflectors, and showed that they're not affected. Their RCS are not affected by the ground. These are some simulations. And then this design was used by Alaska SAR facility. They are using this type of corner reflector now for their ca standard calibration procedure. So point target, as I mentioned, there is uncertainty as how they are interacting with the ground. And you do, the ground itself also is a clutter. So when you have an imaging system, not only you are getting back scatter from the point target in the scene, but also the clutter around the point target. In order to avoid that, we said, why don't we use the distributed target itself as a calibration target? So if we went and measured, let's say, a distributed area that we are mapping or imaging as a calibration target and calibrated that using, for example, a scatterometer system, can we use that as a calibration? So we are using basically this uh, covariance matrix. Uh, we have um, this U, um, that, that is the measurement. This is the scattering matrix or reflectivity of the surface. This is the impulse response. These are the distortion matrices. So if we generate the covariance matrix, which has basically the product of the scattering parameters, we could um, do the uh, estimation of the radar backscatter that way. So the distortion matrix, so if I write the scattering matrix in terms of a uh, column vector, uh, this doesn't work, and the measured one in terms of also a column vector, then the distortion matrix becomes a four by four matrix, and then you can calculate the covariance matrix of the measured response in terms of the distortion matrices and the covariance matrix elements of the target that I would like to measure. And the covariance matrix for a given pixel, this psi is called the ambiguity function of a SAR, similar to radiation pattern of a real aperture, but this is the uh, uh, radiation pattern of the SAR with the range compression and cross-range compression. You get this type of sync function in there. Um, then we notice some properties of this covariance matrix. For example, this is a stationary process. Uh, this subpixel and that subpixel within one image are statistically uncorrelated. Then the problem becomes very simple. So this covariant measure covariance matrix in terms of the actual covariance matrix that you want is independent of this, um, uh, basically, the radiation pattern. And now it becomes an algebraic problem that you can solve. So if I know this, the idea becomes from knowing this and measuring this, I can find the elements of the covariance matrix. Actually, you can simplify that again by noticing that what are those parameters. This covariance matrix does not have 16 independent unknown. In fact, you have only six independent complex unknowns and then one radiometric Calibration unknown, when, and when you are measuring this, you have basically 16 nonlinear equations for 13 unknowns. And that is sufficient to solve this. And we put that into a practice back in 1994 when um, CERC flew over. We had our fully polarimetric L band, C band, X band radiometer system. I think this is Adib or some, is that you? No. So we had an army of graduate students at the time that we took up there. They're very interesting stories. We don't have time to go over them. We, we did a measurement of a grass area using our polarimetric radar measurements. Um, the shuttle flew in 1994. The payload was LC and x band synthetic aperture radar. And we went up there. So we had a super site at the time uh, in the upper peninsula because it was in the cross section of the ascending and descending path. We had opportunities to observe Cersei, you know, radar backscatters of the environment there uh, for both ascending and descending paths. So we used one 50-acre land as our distributed target. We measured that with, uh, uh, we also deployed point targets. Uh, it was very cold. Um, this is Ron Hartica, um, uh, 
a person who was working in the lab. We deployed active and passive um, uh, targets there. We took our scatterometer system there, and we did these type of measurements. So we measured just after Cersei overpass um, the back is scattered. This is, for example, an L band as a function of incidence angle because every time that it flew over, you know, we had a slightly different incidence angle there. These are different days in April, and, and those are incidence angle indicated VV, HH, and HV. For that um, rough surface that you see here, we went around that uh, basically. Uh, 50 acre land, and we did these measurements, and this is the average of that. And these are um, C band and X band backscatter measurements of that area. Uh, this is the Circe uh, image at L band, HHVV, HV, uh, pseudo color map. So corner, we had corner reflectors here, VV equal HH when you add a red and a, a green, you get yellow, so you have that. So these were corner reflectors there. We had an active um, radar calibrator that had equal amplitude in VV, HH, and HV. And therefore, it comes out as uh, white color in here. Uh, these, we were using these 8-inch JPL uh, corner reflectors at the time, and we also measured. We also had this uh, single antenna part that had a delay. And this was a signature, so the delay line at each time, we would show the image of the park in range just to easily identify that. Again, there is equal power in each of those channels. And we use this in order to characterize the distortion parameters of the Cersei for L-band and C-band. And these are the parameters we obtained. And then we uh, looked at the distributed target. This is um, um, what was measured by Cersei. This is what was measured by uh, the truck for different polarization. And we see that there is a little bit of offset. This was used using point target calibration for Cersei. This is used for distributed target calibration. And there is a little bit of radiometric calibration error in there because we don't know, you know how well the point targets were um, correct. And then phase statistics, I don't want to explain this chart much, and I don't know what happened here, that uh, there was a paper in 90s again that I wrote that if you have the covariance matrix, then you can drive from power measurement in covariance matrix all the phase statistics. So similar to, let's say, a Gaussian, you have a mean phase difference, and you have sort of a distribution. And these are shown by this alpha and zeta, and this can be obtained from the elements of the covariance matrix. And you can also use that in your calibration. This is uh, basically those uh, uh, distribution function for different uh, degree of correlation and coherent phase difference. And when you compare the, uh, basically what point targets provided for phase statistics and distributed, we were sort of on top of each other. So the phase information was correct, but there is an offset in the radiometric calibration constant because corner reflectors get distorted, or if they have a little bit of disorientation, you have that type of error. And you get this, depending on which corner reflector you use, that variation could, could change. Um, this is the uh, co uh, phase difference, actually, for, for that. And these are uh, a, a variation of, basically, if you use different corner reflectors, we had three corner reflectors, you would get different uh, value for the radiometric calibration. Anyway, so with that, I wanted to give you an overview as why it is important to do the calibration, because you don't have that much dynamic range, and how you can use physics, actually, to simplify what appears to be a very complex problem, the physics of the problem reduce the uncertainty, and then we apply that to a problem like calibration of Cersei and imaging system using both point and distributed targets. And now, if you have any question, I'll be happy to answer those. Yes, okay, what did you do?
cloudy in that really cold weather, so I used to go hand warmer to keep them warm and keep it clear. I later found out that hand warmers work by having you know, iron filings in them that rust. <laughs> Earth magnetic field locally. Yeah, so Roger not confessing. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, there were also some very interesting um, issues. So we thought we were going to be ahead of the game. So we went and placed these corner reflectors into the ground way before the Cersei. And we thought if we dig the ground and put the corner reflectors, bury them in the ground, would be a very good idea because wind wouldn't blow them. When we came back, we noticed that those holes were filled with water and were frozen. <laughs> and we couldn't get the trihedral out. And Leland went and bought charcoals, and we were trying to. We basically burned them out of the ground. Yes. <laughs> So we, we suffered quite a bit. You graduate student that now complained that you are working too hard. You should have been involved in this Cersei mission. Yes. All right, one more. I'll say this real quick. Um, can you suggest another adaptive method to buy static? Okay, yeah, I talked to, where is Chris? Uh, yes, uh, we, I have some idea. We, we, we need to, to do that for Cygnus. You need to have radiometric calibration. Yes, yes. The Cersei data you had, where in the processing chain was that? Was that almost raw? Was that, did, they, did JPL process it when it was looking at atmosphere effects, all that before you got to you? So the data that we got, we had a raw data and we had a post-process data. So we had both because we could do cross-calibration. Um, uh, cross okay.